Right, morning everyone um, and welcome to our last and final Habitat webinar for this year. Um, it seems to have gone very, very quickly. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed what we've been doing so far um, and hopefully you'll now re-watch some of them at, to your heart's content. They will stay on our YouTube channel for whenever you want to re-watch them. Um, so today we're looking at uh, Bog and Wet Heath. Uh, and Ben Averis is going to take us through that again. Um, as always, uh, because this is a webinar, I cannot see or hear you. Um, if you need to sort of say anything to us specifically, you can use the chat function. Um, if you'd like to ask a question that's maybe about the webinar, or about methodology or anything, then please use the Q&A function. We'll have a little session at the end to do some um, answering of some questions. Um, and as always as well, I'm the one sharing my screen, um, so I'll be sharing uh, Ben's presentation and he'll be asking me to move on to the next slide and he'll have his video off, but he will be able to talk and that's just to do with bandwidth. Uh, we'll aim to have a comfort break about halfway through, it's usually around about the 11 o'clock mark, uh, just for five minutes so that everyone can go and get a fresh cup of coffee or tea or whatever they need to do. Um, so, Ben, um, are you there? <laughs> and are you okay? And, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Brilliant. Okay, I'm just going to set it up so that I can share the screen for you. Um, and I will turn off my video and my microphone. Okay. So, hello. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along to this session, 32, 33 participants so far. Okay, so yeah, we're looking at um, bog and wet heath, NPMS, bog and wet heath habitat. Uh, this kind of illustrated tour through the habitat is um, looking at it through this document that I prepared um, last summer, actually. And so that's a sort of picture on the front of some boggy, wet, heathy landscape up in the um, in the highlands. And if we move on to the next page to begin these things, this, um, you know, where we start getting into discussion about what the habitat um, comprises and its sort of subdivisions. And um, as, a, as another kind of introduction, here's a little poem I wrote last year for the one that last year, I'll repeat it this year. They're a bit silly, these poems, but here we go. About bog and wet heath. Heathers grow in heaths, they do, but bogs are pretty heathy too. Telling bogs and heaths apart, very scientific art. Look for hare's tail cotton grass, the test of bog, it helps to pass. And certain types of sphagnum moss, tricky ones, they'll make you cross. So are the branches thin or fat? What's the colour? Stuff like that might lead us to a species name for the habitat classification game. In the wild north and west, wet heaths and bogs are at their best. Some are blanket, others raised. Some are grassy because they're grazed. Wet heath and bog on peaty ground, saturated all around, soggy because it rains and rains, or cut across by hidden drains. Watch your feet on slippy peat. Falling on your seat ain't so neat. The nasty peatland world don't care. It's waiting there for fools who dare. So, we can be those fools and get stuck into the wet heath and bog habitats. Um, and so uh, on this page, there's some photographs at the bottom of, um, of bog, wet heath and dry heath, because we do need to remind ourselves how to tell dry heath, because they, they can all be very heathy. Bogs can have so much heather, um, as I mentioned in that poem and they can look very similar to wet heaths and we need to be clear about how we distinguish wet heaths from dry heaths as well. Um, so <clears throat> um, it, it, it also helps that there, that there are only three subdivisions in this fine scale habitat, some of them have had more, so blanket bog, raised bog and wet heaths and they can all have quite a lot in common and the ways of separating them are not hugely complicated because we haven't got a massive range of species really to deal with compared with how it's been in some of the woodland habitats, some of the grasslands as well. Um, so um, as I've written in this text on this page that bogs are mostly on, on sort of deeper peat, which tends not to be on such steep ground, although it does vary, it can be very flat or it can be on definite slopes. <clears throat> um, and um, 
wet heaths tend to be on shallow peat, but sometimes wet heath vegetation can develop on the surface of a deeper peat. Maybe, for example, if it's dried out for some reason to do with, with draining or, um, or burning. Um, and the way that we separate those, the wet heaths, wet heath vegetation from bog vegetation is based on the, the species composition. Um, blanket bogs and raised bogs they have very, very similar vegetation. You can't really tell the two apart on the basis of their vegetation. It's more to do with the hydrology and the kind of landform, the raised bogs, as you know, I'm sure, being this, this kind of broad dome of, um, of deep pea that's built up um, in, in where there's been a kind of depression and um, a sort of wet, very wet depression that's sort of built up in it. And you have a distinct sort of zone around the edge. They're quite a distinct hydrological unit compared with blanket bogs. Um, and um, I think if we um, if we go on to the next page, we can start looking at some of the the main species that we need to know about for the purpose of separation between um, bog and wet heath, and both of those together from from the dry heath. So. Um, there's a few pages here of some of the sort of fundamentals of these, these species that we need to know. This first one here was a species that we find a lot in both bogs and wet heaths, but um, we hardly get them at all in the dry heaths. So these help to, to, to sort of cut out the dry heaths and, um, so that we know we're looking in at this particular MPMS broad habitat. Um, Cross-leaved heath, there Erica tetralix has these lovely pale pink flowers at the top in a little, always that kind of round um, globular little cluster, very distinct. And the leaves are in whirls of four and they look kind of greyish green because they've got pale coloured hairs along their edges. Unmistakable. Deer grass is, um, there's some more photographs of this further on in this presentation. It's, uh, it's actually a kind of sedge and um, what we see of it is really a dense tuft of these wiry looking um, rather straight stems, each of which has a tiny little flower head at its top. But the little flower heads can be relatively inconspicuous because they're so small and dull brownish coloured. They're at the most conspicuous as in, in that photograph there in the in the sort of spring when when they're actually in flower and you've got the stamens, pale colour stamens, they're more visible and then the um, the whole plant hasn't yet grown up to its full height at that stage either. Um, later on, um, the flower heads get less conspicuous and we need to be sure about how to separate that from some other things, in, um, particularly the hare's tail cotton grass. Um, meanwhile, um, the purple moor grass towards the middle of that page, a big tufted tussocky grass with um, long and rather broad leaves that um, they go that buff colour in the autumn. And it's easy to tell really because the, um, the leaf blades get narrower towards their base. Um, it's surprising that happens um, comparatively rarely among our grasses. Most of our grasses, the blade, the leaf blade starts at its base at pretty much maximum width and runs parallel, sided for, for most of its length. But in the purple moor grass, that's one of those few grasses where it starts a little bit narrower and gradually widens. And it doesn't have a ligule, that little sticking up bit at the base of the leaf blade. Quite unmistakable. And you get a whole mass of these pale, buffy coloured leaf blades that go all curly and rest in, on the ground in between the tussocks. Those two cotton grasses, they both got the white coloured um, cottony heads, but they're totally different from each other in, um, in other ways. The common cotton grass is more like an ordinary sedge, because they're both in the sedge family, by the way. Common cotton grass has got leaves a few millimetres wide that are at first glance just like so many other sedge leaves but you can always tell it because uh, towards the tip of the leaf the last few centimeters um, have a distinct um, solid trigonus we call it sort of um, three-angled very really quite hard solid um, spear-like tip at the end which is unique really to that species at least to find it that long really kind of a, a few centimeters length um, hare's tail cotton grass, on the other hand, is quite different to leaves are thin and wiry and the plant forms great big tussocks compared with the smaller tufts of common cotton grass. And, um, and, oh, and it has just a single white cottony head, whereas the common cotton grass has um, little groups of three or four cottony heads that all kind of dangle off to one side. 
common in the hair's tail cotton grass is just a single one sticking up and yeah without those if you haven't got those flower those cottony heads it can look a bit like the deer grass further to the left but you can always tell by looking close and if it's deer grass even if those flower heads at the top of the stem are quite inconspicuous you'll still either see them or you'll see where they've broken off because it's kind of sudden there's a sudden sort of sharp um, square cut top to that stem whereas in the hair's tail cotton grass all that tough that big tussock of wiry looking things they're actually leaves rather than stems and so each one tapers um, to a to a sort of neat point. Um, hair's tail cotton grass doesn't tend to go as bright orangey colour in the autumn and winter as the deer grass does. Deer, deer grass goes beautiful rich colour. Uh, bog myrtle on the right it looks like a miniature kind of willow its leaves are narrow oval shape but um, they've got a very strong resinous kind of beautiful smell if you rub them and they've got um, not a huge number of teeth on their edges some willow leaves have more some willow leaves have have very few but um, bog myrtles sort of in between it's got um, a relatively small number of quite widely spaced teeth along the edge and the stems are quite reddish quite easy thing to identify so those if you get um vegetation with um, a heathy kind of vegetation with a lot of those any one of those it could be just one of those species in big quantity or it could be a mix of two or more of them if they're well represented then you'd be looking at either wet heath or bog and not dry heath you, you might get bits and bobs of one or two of those species in some dry heath but only very very sparsely Okay, next page has got some species that um, that we can find both in the dry heaths and in either bogs or wet heaths or both bogs and wet heaths. So they're shared. Um, heather goes right across the whole range, bogs, wet heaths and dry heaths. Um, and of all those little ericoid, pinky, purpley flowering things, it's the one that's got the smallest leaves and the smallest flowers, the little thin spikes of pale pink flowers. Bell heather, um, has got longer leaves in whirls of three and those um, spikes short to fairly long spikes of bigger darker pink flowers. It's most common in dry heaths as you might wonder what it's doing on this page where we're talking about bogs and wet heaths but actually it can be really very common in some forms of wet heath. That's the wet heaths that are um, relatively dry as wet heaths go, but they, they're still wet heaths, not dry heaths, because they've got things like deer grass in them. Um, so that's that's one of these shared species. Very, very occasionally you can actually find bell heather growing in a bog. That's pretty rare to see. Um, the bilberry or bladeberry, as we call it up here, or whortleberry and other names it got. Um, is easy to tell with those green stems that have longitudinal ridges and those oval green leaves that go kind of reddish in the autumn and they've got little teeth along their edges and of course the edible berries. Um, that's very common in a lot of the dry heaths but also occurs in some of the bogs and some of the wet heaths. Um, the cowberry similar size more or less to the bilberry but the leaves are evergreen and they're not so toothed um, and they've got a, a sort of darker colour and a leathery sort of texture. It's more, more kind of northern upland species as well on the whole. Um, that's very common in some of our upland dry heaths and in some of the bogs it can be very common as well. Rather less so in wet heaths but it does occur here and there in some upland wet heaths. Crowberry, similar kind of distribution to the, um, the cowberry in, in being mainly northern and upland and um, most common in dry heaths and in some kinds of bogs, but also occurring in a few wet heaths as well. Uh, easy to tell, leaves are a bit like bell heather, but they're thicker in texture and they've got that white stripe underneath. Um, so um, it doesn't, doesn't grow very tall. And, um, but the, yeah, the higher up, you, higher up the hills you go, the more conspicuous it can be, especially, especially in dry heaths. Okay, um, the next page um, is sort of um, summarising some of the shared species here between bogs and wet heaths. Um, the, um, the end of that paragraph, the cross leaf heath, deer grass, purple moor grass, the um, common cotton grass and the hare's tail cotton grass and the bog myrtle. Those are all species that we can get both in bogs and wet heaths but only very 
very sparse, no more than very sparse in dry heaths. So you might ask, how do we tell the bogs um, from the wet heaths um, in, the, in terms of their vegetation? Hare's tail cotton grass is a very much a bog species. So there's a, a picture of a big tusk of it there on the left. Um, and there's quite a lot of it in that photograph beyond that tussock. So there we're looking at bog. You can tell just the, the abundance of that species alone, especially when the cottony heads are around. It's very more conspicuous. Um, so that's one easy way to tell those kinds of bogs that have a lot of that species. But the abundance of it varies among our bogs, um, although it's mostly in most bogs you will find it. Um, but in some rather less so. Some, so sometimes there are cases of using some other species to inform us that we're in a more of a bog kind of vegetation. Um, and for that purpose, it's very helpful to look at sphagnum mosses. And those two pictures on the right are some of our larger sphagnum, sphagnum mosses, uh, larger in the sense of the size of their, their branch leaves, the little branches that stick out. Um, if those branch leaves are bigger, then the um, the branches look fatter. So um, that gives the plant quite a different appearance to some of the, what you could think of as the sort of smaller sphagnums um, where the branch is thinner. So if you see thick, um, thick branch sphagnum with that pale-ish uh, ochre colour, top right picture, you'll probably be looking at sphagnum papillosum, which is really common in a lot of the wetter kinds of bog very good sort of indicator for that. Occasionally we find it in some wet heaths, wetter sorts of wet heaths, but it's mainly in the bogs. And if you find something um, of similar size, but, um, but a redder colour, um, then you'll be looking at what we used to call Sphagnum Magellanicum. It's now been split into different species of which in this country we find Sphagnum Medium and Sphagnum Divinum. Uh, medium being generally about the commoner, I find. Um, and um, they're very much bog species as well. So there's a couple of good indicators among the sphagnum mosses. Um, and um, next picture, next page has a closer view of some more of that sphagnum papillosum, the pale ochre one. And you see the red colored moss in there. It's not the big red bog indicator red moss that we had on the previous page. It's actually an extremely common red colored moss called sphagnum capillifolium that has much, much smaller leaves. Um, the branch leaves are really, really tiny compared to those of the papillosum. And that's why the branches are much, much thinner. And so it looks all much more shrunk. It's much uh, a very, very different scale of plant. So um, it's not, um, it's not, it's not, it's easy to distinguish those red, the little red from the big red um, sphagnum moss. Actually on the next page, uh, we have a picture of each of those two red ones. The little one on the left, sphagnum capillifolium, which is so common in all kinds of wet acidic places, including wet heaths and even some dry heaths, actually, um, as we'll have seen in the heathland presentation that I did a while back. Um, and then on the right, the, the big red moss, the, his sphagnum medium, this one. Um, so quite a different scale. The one on the right is very much a bog indicator. The one on the left is very common in bogs, but it can also be in so many other ha habitats, it's not specifically telling us that we're in bog. Um, okay, uh, next picture is um, one uh, first of a few pictures of a, more of a kind of landscape scale, looking at what bog vegetation um, looks like. Um, so this, this in this photograph, you can tell it's quite heathy because it's got that brown colour with a lot of heather. Um, but the abundance of those white cottony heads of hare's tail cotton grass, each one a single white cottony head, tells us straight away that that's a kind of bog. And it's very, very extensive there. You can see it going way into the distance, that pale colour of the white, um, the white cottony heads add that sort of pale tinge to it as we go further back. Whole big spread there of, um, of bog. Uh, it's kind of bog that is dominant, co-dominated by heather and hare's tail cotton grass and the national vegetation classification we call it M19, Coluna Ariophorum vaginatum bog. Um, the next um, picture, next page, has another example of the same. This is uh, a bit more grazed uh, and you can see the effect of trampling associated with grazing there in that bit of bare peat in the front, but also because it's more grazed the, um, the white cottony heads, not quite so common. Uh, so it's a kind of 
um, in, if you're in that kind of bog where you get a lot of hair, a lot of either species of cotton grass, the common or the hare's tail one, and then the abundance of the flowering heads, the white cottony heads, is a kind of rough guide to the intensity of the grazing. Less grazed, you'll see more of them, more of those white heads. So this is a little bit of a more grazed example of the same kind of vegetation, the Kuluna areophorum bog um, up in the hills of Perthshire. The next page has a photo of um, some bog that's not got so much of the hair's tail cotton grass. In fact, it looks quite undistinguished vegetation. It's rather heathy. You can see there's some, there's some heather in there. Uh, there's also cross-leaved heath and there's common cotton grass and millennia. See the flowering stems of the purple moor grass, those pale, long um, stems there. And um, that's one of the examples of bog in which if we look closer, which I did, that's okay, I know that it's that kind of bog site with the photograph, that we can um, see a whole load of, um, in this case it was sphagnum papillosum, that pale ochre coloured moss, um, which, which there helped to swing it into bog habitat as opposed to wet heath. Um, the next photo has something Kind of similar. It's, this is this, these are examples of wetter bog. Now the Coluna areophorum bog, co-dominated by dense mass of heather and hair's tail cotton grass, tends mostly to be at the drier end of bog vegetation. Um, and in that kind of stuff, the the, um, the the pictures that we saw with all the white cottony heads of hair's tail cotton grass, you can get sphagnum, but it's mostly the little red sphagnum, not the not the strictly bog indicator sphagnum species. It's mostly the sphagnum capillifolium. Here in the wetter bogs, where we get a lot of sphagnum papillosum, um, sphagnum as a whole um, typically tends to be a bit more extensive, with great more more of a range of species. And so here's an example showing some patches of sphagnum papillosum, along with uh, this heather and the, I can see cross-leafed heath in there and the pale tussocks, middle distance, uh, middle distance or middle of the photo are the hare's tail cotton grass. So that's in there as well, along with deer grass, it's quite a mix of uh, species. This is an example of, um, of wet, uh, the wetter kind of um, wetter end, the wetter half, if you like, of bog vegetation. Um, and on the next page, we've got some um, round-leaved sundew, which is extremely common in a lot of the wetter kinds of bog, little insectivorous plant. Sundews, as do as with butterworts, they grow in places that are nutrient poor, and they obtain nutrients by catching insects. Um, so. The commonest of our sundews, this one, the round leaf sundew, easy to tell because the leaves are round, little and round. Um, there are a couple of other ones, sundews, that have um, longer leaves. So they're kind of um, a long oval to oblong shape, quite different to this. They're not so common. Um, the intermediate, the, the well, Trosera intermedia and Trosera anglica. Um, I've um, written in the page here how you tell them apart if the um, like the length of the leaf and um, whether the flowering stem comes straight up from the middle or if it sticks out, comes from underneath sticking out the side. But you can get them both in bogs and wet heaths, but uh, Drosera anglica, the bigger ones, more of a, a bit more common in the, in the bogs and intermedia, a, bit, a little bit more wide ranging, can go in slightly less wet places. But the habitats of all three sundews overlap an awful lot, but by far the commonest is the round leaved one, which um, is very common in a lot of the wetter bogs, but also can grow in wet heaths and some other kinds of flush vegetation. So um, any kind of sundew isn't going to tell us straight away that we're in bog. I have to remember that. Um, next page has another thing that's uh, about which it's useful to um, remember that it's not just in bogs. This is what this is the bog asphodel. So it's actually got bog in its name. Um, but uh, and that might make you think, oh, it's a bog plant, but um, it can be just as common in wet heaths and some kinds of flushes as well. Easy to tell because when it's in flower, it looks like a kind of yellow orchid. It's unmistakable. Uh, when it's not in flower, if you've got the old flower heads, like that picture on the right, that's really quite um, quite obvious as well. It attracts your attention because of those old pale brown things sticking up. Otherwise, you can pick it out from the leaves, which are very 
they come in a very flat and tough. They look a bit like miniature yellow flag leaves. Of course, a heck of a lot smaller. A yellow flag is a very big, tall thing. Um, and there's not much habitat overlap between those two species either. Yellow flag likes nutrient rich or more mesotrophic sort of wet places, whereas um, the, the, the um, bog asphodel likes it more sort of peaty and acid. Um, someone's written, the slide is still showing crossed for me. Um, I don't know about that, uh, what that's, um, I can see the slide here, something maybe on somebody's computer system, not quite um, linked up to things probably, I don't know, I really don't know. Um, and um, okay, so um, if you see a lot of bog asphodel, you might be in a bog, or you might be in a wet heath, or you might even be in something something else. But it's at least it's worth knowing it's very common in a lot of the bogs, especially the wetter bogs. Okay, next page. Um, it's the a similar story as far as naming is concerned, because it's got the name bog in it as well, bog myrtle. It is very common in a lot of bogs, um, that being mainly the wetter half of the bogs. Um, rather than the drier Coluna aeriophorum types. Um, but equally common in some of the wet heaths and also in some of the vegetation that's, um, that's got an awful lot of purple moor grass um, and is otherwise not, not so much of a wet heath kind of species or purple moor grass vegetation. So it's rather, it's more wide ranging than just bogs, generally in wet, fairly acid, peaty sort of places. Um, so it's travels bog and wet heath. Uh, there's a close-up of the leaf. See those relatively um, sparse, rather well-spaced teeth along the edge. And um, in the winter half of the year, the reddish colour of the stems is quite apparent as well. And that's about typical height in places where it depends how great it is, actually. It's quite palatable to um, it's a large herbivores, so where there's a lot of grazing, it can be reduced down to less than 30 centimetres in height. Um, where there isn't, where the grazing has been totally taken away, maybe in some fenced exposures, it can get up to a couple of metres tall, it can be pretty big. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty conspicuous plant in a lot of bogs and wet heaths. Okay, next um, page has some some of that purple moor grass, those dense, big, tall tussocks, this unmistakable grass with long leaves. Um, it can, um, well, it's naturally naturally present in bog and wet heath vegetation as uh, one of the sort of components, along with heather and uh, those other species that I've shown you. But in some places, it actually gets to be dominant, uh, strongly dominant, and that's generally an indication that something's happened like um, burning or grazing. So if it's been more grazed, the um, animals will tend to cause reduction in the amount of heather, definitely heather, because heather is very palatable. Cross-leaved heath is not so palatable, so that can actually continue on being quite common in some places that are heavily grazed, but they'll take out the heather. Um, and if it's been burned, that can also um, you know, someone's written a thing about bog asphodel up on the other day, very orange on the sea tents. It can look quite orange as well, yeah. Okay, millennia. It's, um, if there's been burning, that can really encourage the, an increase in the growth of the purple moor grass uh, because it's got little buds very low down that can still um, not be so affected by, by burning, whilst other plants have been, um, have been affected much more more severely by the burn. So after some burning, uh, other things can decrease and the purple moor grass can increase. So there's various things. Um, usually, it's usually some combination of um, grazing or burning will be behind the great dominance of purple moor grass. Um, and, and this can happen in places where the previous vegetation was more of a proper kind of bog vegetation, like we've seen some photographs of already, or it could have been wet heath. And um, if it's on a very, a very deep peat, especially on level ground like this, it's pretty clear that it's been derived from bog. And uh, we often find bits of hair steel cotton grass mixed in with it in these sort of situations as well. Um, so that, that, that is a kind of bog, uh, modified form of bog there. Later on, we'll see a photograph of it in a place where it seems to have been derived 
more by wet heath and the classification of that is different. Okay, next page and um, thinking of like modified bog, bog that's been modified through something like grazing or burning. Well, here's another example where in some situations it can lead to a dominance, not so much of purple moor grass, but of the hare's tail cotton grass, aerial from vaginatum. Um, particularly where it's grazing, um, where grazing has had a big, um, been, a, been a very significant factor. So it's uh, caused a reduction, basically the main thing is reduction in the amount of, um, of heather. So it kind of goes from a more browny, heathy looking bog to more of a green bog. And this can happen, especially where the previous kind of vegetation would have been the Kaluna areophorum bog. That's sort of in the slightly drier half of bog, co-dominated by mixtures of hare's tail cotton grass and heather. Um, so that can, that can lead to this really quite distinctive form of a rather modified bog where it's uh, the dominant species, certainly the dominant vascular plant, is um, hare's tail cotton grass, these masses, tussocks of it. Okay, um, so the, um, the next page has got uh, actually another example of that kind of vegetation, hare's tail cotton grass bog, um, but showing the sphagnum um, species in between there. There's a lot, you can, you can, it varies in the wetness and um, varies also therefore in the amount of, um, of sphagnum moss that you get in between the tussocks. Um, and and then, but another aspect of variation is not just how much sphagnum there is compared, to, you know, it's just in total quantity, but actually what the species are, because you can get a very grazed bog in which the sphagnum species are still remaining reasonably well, um, even though the heather's been grazed out and it's mostly just hare's tail cotton grass, but you can still get the, the sphagnum papillosum or the sphagnum, the red colored little red sphagnum capillifolium being very, very common. But along with that grazing, there can be a lot of trampling as well, which disrupts that sphagnum layer. And um, it's not exactly clear what the causal factors are in total, but it seems possible that some degree of, new, some amount of nutrient enrichment to do with dung and urine, might also be having an effect. Whatever it is, it's very common to find that in these rather trampled lower zones in between the tussocks, we tend to very often lose the um, sphagnum, the, the sort of more red and ochre sphagnum capillifolium and capillosum kind of moss layer, and instead uh, end up with more of the pale yellowy green sphagnum phallax, which is one of our very, very commonest sphagnums and is and in itself is not strictly a bog plant at all. It grows in, naturally in bogs. Sphagnum phallax is really quite thinly scattered. So if you see any kind of bog with great sheets of it, like we see in this photo here, it's probably been something going on, it's especially associated with um, grazing or associated with trampling that goes along with grazing. And the same is true of Polytricum communi, that lower right-hand photo is a very unmistakable, great big moss with long leaves that stick out in all directions. It looks, they look like kind of miniature conifer needles. Um, um, on a decent, really, you know, intact, not very disturbed kind of bog, you won't tend to see very much of that species. Um, but the more disturbance there seems to have been, the more common it gets. And the, that and the sphagnum phallax often go hand in hand together. So that's quite a common sight to see a lot of them where the bog has been affected in other ways that the showing like the, in, again in, in the lack of the reduction of heather, the kind of greener bog, but then that sort of different kind of moss layer underneath is another, another hint. Sometimes, sometimes the bog can still be quite heathy, so at first glance, it might look like it's quite normal, decent, fairly heathy bog. But then when you get into it, you find that the moss layer is mostly those two species. And that again can lead you to think something's been going on here, some kind of disturbance. Okay, um, next picture um, is uh, kind of a reminder that, well, we, we've, we've just been looking at a lot of photographs of bogs uh, they've actually all been blanket bogs. We got these two fine scale types in the MPMS bog and wet heath. Um, in I mean the bog part, bog part of it, uh, blanket bog and raised bog. And um, 
they've the, those photographs have all been blanket books so far, but they still actually illustrate the kind of vegetation that we can get on either blanket or raised bog. Because as I said earlier on, the the vegetation can be much the muchness much, much the same right across, and it can vary both within blanket bogs and raised bogs, and it can be the same kind of range of variation more or less. Uh, and here is a photograph of uh, blanket bog on the top and some raised bog underneath, and you can see how similar they could look. Uh, so it's quite understandable they could look so similar, similar, similar vegetation. Um, and um, the next um, picture has got another example of some raised bog. So if we're then thinking, what's the difference between the raised and the blanket? Um, the raised bogs are these sort of domes, gentle, very gentle domes. The peak that gets um, raised, obviously deep peaks in the middle, um, and then going down to uh, what they call the lag zone around the edge. And so there's a bit of a slope all the way around the edge of this dome. We call it the rand, and then um, then you end up with what they call the lag zone all the way around the edge, where you can get some kind, some some slight amount of mineral enrichment as well. So you can end up with bits of wet woodland, as in that photograph there on the right. We're looking down into the lag zone there. There's some wet, uh, like willowy birch, kind of willow birch kind of woodland, um, rush myers, sedge myers, a mixture of different kinds of vegetation that you can get um, forming a band around a narrow sort of zone around the edge of a raised bog. And raised bogs tend to be more in the um, lowlands, um, in areas where the climate's not quite so, so intensely wet or cool. Um, so they have a, have a rather rather different distribution. Blanket bogs are more in the coolest, wettest parts of the country, where the climate has encouraged the development of peat over bigger areas, including including some slopes as well. So the blanket bogs just go over mixtures of flattish to slightly sloping, or even quite definitely moderately sloping ground in mainly in upland areas. So rather rather different sort of setting. That's how we um, tell the two apart. Really, is the topography, the sort of um, which itself is related to hydrology. So the raised bogs are quite distinct hydrological units, mostly in a kind of lowland setting. Uh, particular parts of the country where you get them a lot include um, the central belt of Scotland, which is where this photo is here. Um, the Solway lowlands on both sides of the Solway Firth is very good examples of raised bog down there. Um, and down through the middle parts of Britain, like uh, the lowlands of, of Yorkshire. Um, and here and there, a bit further south, like uh, North Shropshire and Cheshire, and those lowland plains there, there are um, quite a few raised bogs. and. Um, Lowland parts of Wales further south, like this Tregaran bog, you know, down in um, western parts of mid Wales. Um, but when you get further southeast in Britain, you don't get them really. There's so, so you know, the sort of warmest, driest parts of the country, you don't find them. Ireland, the lowlands of Ireland, there's so loads of raised bogs there. Okay, uh, the next picture, next page, I keep saying picture instead of page, the picture's on the page interchangeable words really I suppose. Um, having said that raised bog vegetation and blanket bog vegetation can be much of a muchness, it is also true that there are some species that grow more on the whole more commonly in raised bogs than in blanket bogs but we shouldn't still shouldn't actually use their abundance to um, separate raised bog from blanket bog. But nevertheless, it is true that cranberry and bog rosemary and those big red sphagnums, medium and divinum, um, tend on the whole to be commonest on raised bogs. Um, that difference in abundance has led to the separation of two different um, vegetation types in national vegetation classification terms, because you get them more in the community called M18, which is mainly on raised bogs and its counterpart on blanket mainly found on blanket bogs is M17, but the two communities overlap in terms of whether they're on raised or blanket bogs. But yeah, sometimes we can find um, quite um, in, in impressive quantities of these, uh, one or more of these three species 
um, and that occurs especially on raised bogs. The, cran the cranberry is like a miniature, like well, it's like a little um, version of wild thyme that has leaves not in opposite pairs because thyme is opposite pairs, but it creeps around in the same way that thyme does. Um, and it has pink flowers that are quite, they're not very big, but they're quite big for the size of the plant because the plant is so small, those little leaves are tiny. Um, and it has these um, lovely round red berries that are edible. Um, bog rosemary is, has these pink flowers, quite distinct when they're out. Otherwise, you can still tell it because it's up, got upright stems with leaves that point up quite a way and they're, um, they've got a funny kind of net veined appearance, these pale, pale veins. Um, which are rather translucent compared with the rest of the leaf and the margins of the leaf can be a little bit enrolled around the edges and um, the yeah we've already seen photos of the big red moss the big red sphagnum um, the uh, next page has a photograph of some bog pools they're quite a feature of a lot of bogs especially blanket bogs and especially further north as is the case here in Sutherland, and they can have quite distinctive sorts of vegetation on a small scale you know, within this one here, for example, has got lots of bog bean growing, growing in it. It's sort of um, little other than the bog bean in this, in this sort of, some of the deeper bog pools are like this in the far north. Um, but some of the shallow ones, as we can see on the next page, um, they can um, they can have thick um, sort of more or more of an extensive vegetation cover of sphagnum mosses, all bright colours, um, mixed with things that species like um, common common grass, as we see on the right, having turned its reddish colour in the autumn. Um, those are about the commonest species in these uh, in these slightly shallower bog pools, common cotton grass and various kinds of um, sphagnum moss, especially sphagnum cuspidatum, and um, which is I think I haven't shown you a close-up photograph of, but uh, it's a pale yellowy green. The ones that are more aquatic this, among the sphagnums tend to be um, more of a paler yellowy green colour, and they include that sphagnum phallax that is incredibly common in all sorts of wet acid places. The one I showed you on the photograph of some rather trampled looking um, bog. Um, okay, the, now on the next page, um, we've got some questions because I was told last year that you liked having questions thrown at you. And so I've put some questions in. And um, so, and then um, Sarah's done some one of these things, the uh, multiple choice one. So, which species indicate most strongly that we're looking at bog and not wet heath? And um, so you've got a choice of species of, of things there. It's, um, it's completely anonymous, so don't worry. We don't know who's voting and saying what. Um, just take a bit of a stab in the dark if you wish um, and I'll just leave it up there for just a couple of minutes and, and then we'll move on. So we've got all of the three questions available for voting. So yeah, how to tell the two cotton grasses apart and how to tell the hare's tail one from the deer grass. We won't wait too long, but just because it's it's not it's not like critical for everybody to um, give an answer before we move on. So, but here are the answers, and um, I'm just going to click off the polls um, box there to see the the page here. Yeah, um, the first question: yes, yeah, the hair tail cotton grass and those big. Sphagnum mosses, papillosum, and the red divinum stroke medium. Don't worry about separating sphagnum divinum from sphagnum medium. It's more fiddly. Just think of it as big red sphagnum. You can think of it that way. Uh, and the um, the second one to tell those two cotton grasses apart. The common one has the wider leaves, with a. In fact, there's a photo, closer photograph of it on the far right there. You can see the leaf of the common cotton grass going up 
to that to up as far as the point where there's a white arrow going in the leaf is of a very ordinary sedge looking type so it's got a slightly v-shaped profile with a groove up the middle um, and then suddenly that stops and the final few centimeters or it can even be several centimeters is like it's all been filled in and it's solid so um, diagnostic feature of that even that's if you've just got the leaves if you've got the flowering heads then it's got multiple white cottony heads as opposed to a single one pointing up and the hair cell cotton grass has got thin wiry leaves and then to tell the hair cell cotton grass from the deer grass it's um all that that tussock is a tussock of leaves each one ending in a fine point whereas in the deer grass it's a tussock of stems each one ending in a flower little flower head which will eventually break off and leave a sort of um a, a, a sort of more of a square cut or roughened end and later in the year the deer grass i said i'd have some photos of that more photos of it with that, that color and it takes on that beautiful um golden color starting at the tips of the stems and working its way back so there's a certain time of year which is already starting now in some places actually when when it's got a bit of both partly green lower down um and then um golden colours starting further out, a bit like one of those things that people used to buy and stick on their office desk and plug it in that had lots, what do they call it, fibre optic things, decoration. Um, but nature's made its own one. So that's the um, the deer grass from the hairstyle cotton grass. The next page, some more questions um, about how we tell wet heath from bog. And how we tell a raised bog from blanket bog um, and yeah is it by species composition for the wet heath from the bog by by the mix of species or by the peak depth and the topography and to tell raised and blanket bogs apart is that done by species or peaks and topography interesting to see these lines <laughs> yeah they move in real time don't they <laughs> yeah mm. um that's great okay i'll end polling and there we are yep the um wet heath from bog by is best done by the um the vegetation the species composition so the bog has the hair tail cotton grass and those big um sphagnums and um, whereas raised bog from blanket bog is it's the topography to look at there that dome of raised peat of, of peat in the raised bog with a lag zone around the edge um, we can't really separate raised bog from blanket bog by vegetation um, okay so we can go on to um, the next page here which is actually wet heaths because we've gone gone through bogs they're looking at typical species and um, how to separate the two fine scale bog habitats from each other um, where we want to have a wee break in the middle I don't know if this might be a good place it's about it's, what is it it's 10 to 11 just a moment it, it's about usually it's been about an hour by the time we've had yeah, I mean, we could have a five minute break now if that's if that's it, in terms of the sort of composition of the presentation, that's fine. Yeah, we're about halfway through the presentation, so I think that'd be fine. Yeah, okay, so if basically we resume at um, basically five to 11, that'll be fine, won't it? Okay. Gives us just over. Okay, all right, I see everyone back here at five to 11 then. Brilliant, okay.
Right, if everyone's back and feeling more comfortable, then um, when you're ready, Ben, you take us away. Good, so welcome back everybody. Wet heat now, as we were looking at bogs earlier. And actually in this photograph, we've got wet, we've got wet heat and bog, this is up in Sutherland. Um, wet heaths are so hugely extensive in um, the West Highlands and the Hebrides, where they're probably about the most extensive uh, kind of semi-natural vegetation, really. But um, they can be in mixtures in kind of mosaics with bog, especially blanket bog. Um, and that's what we see um, here. We've got, we've got sort of blanket bog in the flatter bits. You can see towards the right, for example, there's um, that kind of more uh, ochre coloured, um, warm colour vegetation. Those flatter bits, smoother looking bits. And there's some more of them further away, further, a bit further left as well. Um, but the bulk of the most extensive vegetation in that photograph is wet heath. Um, that's on in the lower half of the photograph. Obviously, when you get onto the steeper ground of those big hills, uh, we go, we switch mainly to dry heath and there are other kinds of vegetation, bits of grassland and cliff vegetation too. But it can be surprising actually in some of these places how um, well up some of the steeper slopes um, the wet heath can actually extend um, uh, and the further northwest you go we find that more um, uh, markedly. Uh, I've done work in the Outer Hebrides for example where there's some steep slopes where you think well that's got to be surely there's got to be dry heath there and actually it turned out to be wet heath because the climate is so um, intensely wet and cool. Um, so um, that's a sort of broad landscape view of uh, mainly wet heath with bits of bog, quite lots of bits of bog, and then some dry heath beyond. Um, the next photo, photo has a closer view of some kind of ordinary wet heath. Wet heath varies a lot really in its, um, in its appearance um, because we've got, we got that group of species that I showed photographs of earlier. Um, that, uh, that are shared between wet heaths and bogs, the deer grass, um, the cross-leaved heath, the bog myrtle, um, and the purple moor grass, those, um, those species, and the common cotton grass as well. And they can be in varying proportions along with different amounts of, um, of heather. So some wet heaths can look darker and more heathy, others can be um, more kind of pale green the colour, some have more purple moor grass, some have um, than others, some, um, some have more purple moor grass than deer grass, and others it's the other way around. So they're really quite variable. This is one in which there's quite a mix of uh, heather, cross your teeth, purple moor grass and deer grass, a sort of um, middle of the road I've meant to uh, suggested there, typical wet heath. But of course, you can see how the general appearance of that vegetation in terms of its color, its sort of patterning and its texture is actually not unlike that of some of the bogs that we've seen photographs of. They can, they can look very, very, really quite similar. A clue, one of the clues that we often get is um, where you get mosaics of the heath and the bog, the wet heath and the bog, is that um, is simply the, um, the amount of the, the slope of the land, especially when it goes on to more rocky ground as it's going in parts of this picture. So topography variation in that often correlates uh, reasonably well with the separation between wet heath and bog, but not entirely, because some bogs can get on some slopes and some flatter ground can be wet, turn out to be wet heath instead of bog when we go and take a close look at it. Those white dots in the foreground they you might think oh is that hair's tail cotton grass which would mean that it could possibly be a bog but it's not it's heath spotted orchid um, so there's one photograph of some fairly typical wet heath um, the next photograph taken at a different time of year because that photograph was um, was in the summer half of the year with the orchid flowering this is now in the winter and um, there's a there's sort of heather and a lot of deer grass there. That's the deer grass has now gone that rich goldeny brown colour, orangey brown, very distinctive. That really helps actually in the autumn and winter 
um, when these when all these species change their color, that can be a good time of year for making a separation between um, certainly wet heath and dry heath, and to some extent um, between wet heaths and bogs as well, because the hare's tailed cotton grass goes a kind of dull, how do you describe it, a sort of dull, pale, browny, um, greyish, browny colour, the tussocks of that. And they can, when you get your eye for it, um, that time of year, they can stand out really, really very well. So it's a good time of year. In fact, the middle of summer is probably about the hardest time of year for, um, for separating those communities by eye, you know, looking at the kind of landscape level. So whenever we've done vegetation mapping in the autumn, we've been very thankful for that time of year because, you know, colours show up differences very well. So here we can see the dry heath separated from the wet heath very, very well. There's no bog in that photograph. It's all um, a mix of wet heath and dry heath, easily separable. And you can see how that wet heath goes onto ground that's quite rocky. The peat isn't very deep, but it's still um, peaty enough and wet enough to have vegetation that is clearly wet heath rather than dry, as in having a lot of deer grass. The deer grass prefers the wetter peaty ground. So you can see those patches where um, Sarah's put in the um, arrow there, picking out bits of wet heath going quite well up that slope, mixed in with dry heath where the deer grass is absent. And in the foreground, it's wet heath on yeah shallow peat on quite so uh, you know with um, quite rocky ground and um, lots of rachmitrium moss that pale grayish green moss patches of it so a particular form of wet heath it looks very different from what we saw in the previous photo um, and that kind of wet heath with a lot of rachmitrium moss is really common and really extensive over large areas in the West Highlands and the Hebrides. The next photo has something rather similar. Wet heath with a lot of deer grass. So in, in this photo and the last photo, it's the, the, the deer grass, the abundance of deer grass that has been the main um, feature to show up wet heath from dry. And um, someone's asking, do I have more of a close up picture of the Rachmitrium um, moss? And I don't think there is actually in this in this presentation. Um, it's if I say it's a um, I'm just paging through because I have the same document on, um, on another computer here, which I've got to sort of so I always know what the next picture is, my next page is going to be. But it's a big moss, which is rather branched and the leaves are quite long and um, they look grayish green. The reason that it has that kind of grayish, pale grayish green color is because each leaf ends in a long white, what we call a hair point. There are quite a lot of mosses that have leaves ending in a white hair point. This is one of the bigger ones of those mosses. And what's rather unusual in that context is that um, it's, it's, a, it's actually a very branched moss because most of our mosses that have distinct white hair points are not really very branched but um, Rachmitrium lanuginosum is branched. It sort of spreads around with these branches coming out the sides of the shoots. Um, and it has very distinct long white hair points. There are um, a few other Rachmitriums that also have white hair points and a branched form, but they are different as Rachmitrium heterosticum, which grows on rocks and is smaller um, and wouldn't look, we wouldn't notice it in photographs at this kind of scale and Rachmitrium, the Canessens group has been split into three and they have more of a yellow or green color moss and they're smaller again. Um, and mostly, unless you're on some shingly habitats like riverside shingles and some actually montane summit heats, you don't tend to see them hugely featuring in at the landscape level. Um, whereas Rachmitrium lanuginosum, great big grayish green thing and you can see patches of it from a big distance. Um, and um, it shouldn't be difficult to find some photographs. I'm sorry I didn't get a, a close um, view of it in, in, this, in this presentation. Um, okay, the, um, but this, in, in this particular picture, um, it, is, it is in there um, along with heather and deer grass, deer grass giving it that warm colour. 
and there's bits of dwarf juniper as we go further into the more montane places we can get certain um, other species occurring within the wet heath um, like dwarf juniper quite extensively in some a few places in the northwest highlands it's always a very special thing to find is dwarf juniper and lichens see those very pale whitish areas like it's the frosting in the sort of lower half of the picture frosting of creamy white cladonia lichens that can be a common feature in some of our wet heaths especially in the northwest so most of that vegetation you can see in that picture is wet heath. Okay, the next page has another example of basically the same kind of vegetation. This is all at the drier end of wet heath. So once again, the um, there's, there's deer grass here that is the species that's um, pulling us into wet heath as opposed to dry heath. It's obviously not bog. It's, um, in fact, there'll be, you'd be hard pressed to find any sphagnum of any kind in that bit of ground that we're looking at here, um, even though it's in a wet part of the country. It's really comparatively well drained. It's got a shallow coating of, um, of peat that's wet enough for the deer grass, um, but it's not really kind of sphagnum -y place and it's not uh, enough of a deep wet peat habitat for hairstail cotton grass either, so clearly not bog. Um, and not dry heath because we've got so much deer grass. And the Rachometrium moss is very common in there, though you can't really pick it out. So you can see just about see some patches of it. And the Cladonia lichens, likewise, those the little pale, little whitish bits dotted all over the place. Lots and lots of that. Um, so that's another, that's a pretty good example of that kind of wet heath that's towards the dry end of wet heath. And in the same kind of wet heath here, even though again you can't really see it in this clearly in this photo, but you'll find bell heather. <clears throat> um, there'll be quite a bit of it scattered through there. Um, next page has um, an example of um, wet heath that's in Galloway because um, once you go south of the highlands uh, wet heath is much less extensive for the most part and except in um, in Galloway this is in mainland Britain if you're in Ireland it's a bit different because the west of Ireland is a bit like the west highlands in many respects and you can get extensive wet heath there as well um, but in um, in Britain um, there is an, another area just in, in Galloway, the hills around there have got some very extensive wet heath and the landscape looks really quite reminiscent of the West Highlands. Um, in, even indeed the wilder parts of the West Highlands, a really wild area around Galloway. Um, so there's nice uh, mosaics over there of wet heath and bog, <coughs> bog being on the flatter bits, and some of the greener bits are vegetation that's dominated by the purple moor grass, the millennia. Um, so the next page has got some more wet heath south of the highlands. This is actually not very far from where I live, on the Lammermuir Hills in southeast Scotland. That's actually quite extensive wet heath for this part of the world, this far east, um, south of the highlands. And there's a lot of heather and cross-leaved heath in there with um, deer grass as well, and some purple moor grass. You can see those, this is not in the summer obviously, but you can still see the old flowering, um, the old flower heads of the purple moor grass sticking up. Um, and there's, there's various kinds of sphagnums in there, but, um, but it's lacking the big thick branched uh, bog sphagnums and it's lacking the hair's tail cotton grass. Um, so, so it's wet heath and not bog, even though you can see the, you know, the general tone and colour and texture of that vegetation is not that dissimilar to um, that of the bogs that we've seen photos of earlier. Um, so it's always the same thing, look for hair's tail cotton grass and the big chunky sphagnums. Uh, the next page has got some more wet heath further south again, this is in Shropshire, um, West Midlands. And it's a mixture of mainly uh, here there's cross leaf heath and some purple moor grass. So for quite species poor, the wet heaths further south are uh, on, on the whole, they're not very species rich in, in the lowlands. Upland ones tend to be a bit richer, but they're hugely variable. Um, but that's, um, that's clearly wet heath. It's not bog because there's no hairs tail cotton grass. Um, 
and are lacking those big sphagnums. So with that much cross-leaved heath and purple moor grass, it cannot be dry heath, even though there is some heather in there as well. But uh, cross-leaved heath and purple moor grass take us into wet heath there. No deer grass at all, but uh, purple moor grass and cross-leaved heath. Um, the next page has got a very different looking wet heath. This is up in the mountains, up at the, in the montane, towards the montane extreme really of um, wet heath. And it's pretty much too high and too cold for heather around there. This is up in Glencoe, pretty high up the Glencoe area. Um, and because, because of the lack of heather, and the lack of cross-leaved heath as well at that altitude, it all looks a little bit greener. So in there, there'll be blaeberry and cowberry and crowberry, um, and even the bog bilberry, vaccinium uliginosum, sort of got glaucous leaves, not very common. Um, so there'll be enough of those kind of shrubby things combined with deer grass. Um, all that group of species growing together <clears throat> that tells us it's wet heath. So it's really a very, very different sort of facet of wet heath and it integrates in subtle ways into Nardus, um, mat grass, snowbed grassland, which in that photograph, we've got a mix of both and it's generally the slightly paler areas that are the, the mat grass, snowbed grassland. Um, so it's, an, it's one of many examples where you've got two different vegetation types and they grade into each other so in such subtle ways that over quite um, <clears throat> quite significant areas of ground you can just be in intermediate vegetation halfway between the two. Um, um, next page is going in a different direction south so into warmer parts of the country um, where we can we, we use obviously we use the same um, means to separate wet heaths from dry heaths and to separate wet heaths from bogs, but um, things can look a bit different because we've got these southern gorse species. That's the western gorse and the dwarf gorse. Here's the western gorse in Wales in some wet heath, and we can tell it's wet heath, not dry heath, because it's got cross-leaved heath and millennia quite common in it, um, which is apparent just from that photo. So that's typical, well, one form of typical um, southern wet heath. The next page has got similar species, uh, but in this instance, the western gorse, it's not flowering there, but um, the western gorse is so extensive uh, that it gets a little bit harder to make that distinction because western gorse can also grow very, very commonly in dry heaths. It straddles wet heath and dry heath. Uh, but we can still tell that here we're looking at wet heath because there's a lot of cross-leaved heath growing in there and um, and the purple moor grass too. Um, the, um, usually purple moor grass is so obvious because of great big tussocks of it. Here they could be quite tussocky but there's just so much of the, um, the western gorse, Ulex gallii, that is obscuring a lot of those growing a bit taller than a lot of the tussock. Parts, but still the some of the leaves and a lot of the flowering stems are able to be to grow taller and more conspicuous so that's wet heath as well there's a lot of western gorse um, down south the next page has got some um, closer views of the different gorse species the the widespread ordinary gorse <clears throat> there's got some details on there how to tell them apart i won't go into all the details but uh, suffice to say as you go from left to right, the height of the shrubs gets smaller. So the dwarf gorse is the smallest thing, usually less than a meter tall. And the flowers, or the, um, <coughs> the size of that little bracteal, the base of the calyx there, um, and the calyx its size itself um, help to separate them. So they're bigger on the biggest on the um, ordinary gorse, smaller on the western gorse and the dwarf gorse. Um, and all three, um, and somebody's writing, the dwarf course can be almost lost among the heather. It can because it's such a, it's such a little, a little thing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the they can overlap in size. So western gorse can get quite big. In some places, you'll find ordinary gorse that's been grazed down to a meter or so. 
and the western uh, other places you can find western gorse that's got up to a couple of meters uh, but then other details of the the leaves which are more grayish colored and deeply grooved in the ordinary gorse that helps separate them um, those those heaths with the the western gorse and the dwarf gorse are lovely things to look at because they're dotted with yellow amongst all the um, pinky purples of the heather and the bell heather um, and then the pale purple of the cross leaves heath. Those, the, the photographs there of the western gorse and the dwarf gorse are actually taken in dry heath, not in wet heath, but I put them in here just for the purposes of looking at the species um, as opposed to the habitat. The, um, the next photograph, next page has um, is, is looking at bristle bents because I didn't mention it, I did mention it a couple of pages back. Um, and it's a very distinctive kind of grass that's restricted to the southwesternmost parts of Britain, mainly southwest England, <clears throat> um, but also the extreme south of Wales. And it's very tus uh, tussocky, little sort of low grown, but really very dense tufts of thin, wiry leaves and, it's, and a branched flower head. It looks a bit like most similar really to wavy hair grass that I've also put photos of there. Um, but you can tell it like when it's in flower, it's you see the wavy hair grass in the middle. The wavy hair grass is, by the way, is very, very common nationally all over the place. And it gets into all kinds of heaths and bogs as well. Um, and it's got a very sort of openly and rather irregularly branched flower head with not a huge number of um, individual little florets, lots of space in it. The, the bristle bent flower head tends to remain more, a bit more narrow, doesn't open out usually quite as widely as that of the wavy hair grass and the branches are a bit more regular um, in, the, in the sort of form, uh, form of agrostis bent grasses in general. They have um, little branches in the flower head in, in whorls. So the whole flower head, if it does open out, it's got more of a sort of regular conical shape to it. Quite different to that of the wavy hair grass. Um, also the leaves of bristle bent are stiffer and more of a grayer green color than those of the wavy hair grass. It does very well the bristle bent in places where there's been some kind of burning or disturbance, usually burning, and, um, and it can really take off. And wavy hair grass, likewise, actually, it can grow very abundantly where there's been that kind of disturbance or fell, felling of conifer plantations and wavy hair grass can get very, very common, at least temporarily, before other things get in. Um, so bristle bent is, um, is a species in the southwest, in, um, not really in bogs, but in wet heaths and dry heaths, so it straddles wet and dry heaths. Um, Okay, the next picture is of some wet heath down by the sea. Um, looking at variation in wet heath, we've seen up at the montane end, we've seen drier forms of wet heath, we've seen southern ones with the gorses and the um, and the agrostis curtisii, the bristle bent. And then, yeah, right down by the coast, you can find wet heath in which there might even be some maritime species. You can get a bit of thrift and a bit of sea plantain, for example, in, in, in wet heath in this kind of situation. Um, uh, very commonly, you'll find bits of ordinary heather coluna in there as well. But in this, this is one of those places where the coastal heath is damp enough that it's, uh, it's got cross-leaved heath as well. It's very, very abundant. The next page has uh, some wet heath that again looks fairly sort of indistinguished, just some ordinary <clears throat> heathy vegetation in which we've got a lot of heather um, and cross-leaved heath. Uh, cross-leaved heath is one of the main things there in this example that's, that's telling us that we're in wet heath as opposed to dry heath. Um, but there is purple moor grass in this one as well. You can see some of the taller flowering stems of it. Um, but an another thing in uh, in this particular instance here is that there's um, the, there are species indicative of kind of flushing and a little bit of um, mineral enrichment coming through. In this particular case, the blue grey tinged leaves of the carnation sedge are helping to pick that out. Um, this is a 
um, uh, another kind of variation as well. So yeah, we've got general wetness and dryness of these heaths and northern and the southern, but then flushing, how much water movement there is coming through and if it's bringing some kind of mineral and en mineral enrichment. Uh, so you can get flushed wet heaths, which can be quite species rich. They do vary. Some of the more acid flushed ones, not so rich, but carnation sedge is one of the commonest species that um, can pick out uh, that can reflect that uh, kind of flushing of the habitat and very often when we look closer we'll find some more species maybe some kind of mosses and um, mosses that like it a little bit less acidic that can be growing amongst the um, other plants in the wet heaths the next page is another example of um, wet heath that's got some flushing and in this instance, the black bog rush has um, been able to go very well in this flushed wet heath. The black bog rush generally does like some kind of base enrichment. Um, so for through through large parts of Britain, it's really a plant of base rich mires, base enriched sedge mires, not really so much wet heaths, but um, base rich sedge mires. But the further west you go, it can also get into wet heaths and then in the extreme west, uh, I'm talking here really more about Ireland, <clears throat> the western part of Ireland than anywhere else, but also the extreme western parts of, um, of the highlands and the Hebrides, some of those places the black bog rush can actually get into bog, into blanket bog. Um, but yeah, uh, that's you've got, you've got to go to those extreme western places really to see that but um not quite so far west or more commonly in those western areas we can find black bog rush growing amongst wet heath flushed examples of wet heath very characteristic thing in the a lot of parts of the west highlands and in some parts of um, southwest england as well you can find it um the um, on the next page we've got another kind of um, another wet heath that looks really quite ordinary. This is down in um, in Shropshire again. I was down there a few years ago looking at some um, various habitats, and um, in in this one it's clearly wet heath because there's a lot of purple moor grass and um, cross leaved heath. <clears throat> there is also some carnation sedge, quite a bit of it. There, but at uh, this scale of this photo, you can't really pick it out. Um, but and, and there are quite a few other things there that were a um, result of the slight enrichment um, that the flushing gave. So it's a fa you know, fairly rich wet heath. That's often the case with various kinds of wetland, various kinds of vegetation all, um, all together, really, that um, it can look much of a muchness and quite ordinary and uniform from a bit of a distance. But when you get in there, you can find a great richness of species. Um, the next page, um, we've got a few, a few photos here of um, things where management, land management uh, is more of the, the focus because what we've been looking at there has been wet heath, variation in wet heath that's kind of more to do with um, natural physical factors, how wet it is. Um, and how flushed it is, that kind of thing. But superimposed onto that is um, other things like grazing and burning. So generally speaking, the more grazed it is, the less heathy it is, certainly the less heathery it is. There's a cross-leaved heath can tolerate a fair bit of grazing because it's not really that palatable compared with um, ordinary heather and compared with bell heather either. Ordinary heather and bell heather are very palatable. So where they've been common in the wet heath, they'll get some um, grazed um, <clears throat> and grazed out more if the grazing um, becomes more intensive. That's what's happened here in this photo. So deer grass has been left as actually the dominant species. Um, so it's a very common sight actually through large areas of wet heath that are sort of more or less quite heavily grazed. Um, that uh, dwarf shrubs can not be very common at all, but deer grass very, 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 very common. So even though it's a kind of sedge, um, we still call this a wet heath. Deer, gra deer, deer grass itself is very much a wet heath and, and bog species. Um, so here we're looking at very green grazed wet heath dominated by deer grass. Um, 
the next page has got a burnt example of wet heath. This is in Grousemore, <coughs> Grousemore kind of landscape where it's been patch burned and um, the, in the foreground, it's, um, we can see a lot of flowering heads of cross-leaved heath there, but there was also heather and it's all fairly short, shorter than it is in the middle of the photo where it was um, uh, not burnt, well it probably has been burnt, but not so recently and it's had more time to grow taller. Um, so that's a very common sight to have um, burning affecting the appearance of the, um, of the wet heaths. Um, in some places it affects the bogs as well, but they shouldn't really, people shouldn't really be burning bogs. But yeah, here and there we do find it. Um, the next picture is um, some vegetation dominated by that purple moorgrass. And um, the earlier picture we had with purple moorgrass vegetation was on very flat ground on deep peat, where it was clearly derived from bog and can be classed as a form of bog, albeit very modified. Um, and as I'd said then, it's very common to find some, at least some hairstail cotton grass growing scattered within the purple moor grass in those bog places. But then we find big areas, huge areas in some western area, western parts of the country, where the vegetation is dominated by purple moor grass and the peat is not so deep and we're not finding hairstail cotton grass scattered among it and there's, there's no um, nothing there really to suggest that it's a bog habitat and so um, it's probably been derived from uh, wet heath by some combination of burning and grazing. But so what it results, what, what we what it's um, formed there is a kind of millennia mire that is not really wet heath vegetation. So in um, NPMS terms, um, that would have to come into the marsh and fen <coughs> category because um, because it's like it, you can't classify it as a wet heath. It's, uh, floristically it's not a wet heath and um, the it'll go into the more acid end of the marsh and fen NPMS type because remember we had those we had a presentation on that quite a while back now and it's got those two different fine scale types um, the acid one and the basic one so that's what that'll be uh, very very extensive over large areas of the west especially uh, occurs more patchily well to the east too but mostly in the west to be got stuff to walk through when it's on very on on some the wetter ground and that of course includes the actual ones that are bog habitat as well some of those are horrendous things to walk through with the uh, where you get a lot of sphagnums mixed in with the millennia and there in those sort of places and where it's on deeper peat on flatter ground of course it is a kind of bog but yeah not this um the next few pages we got um some individual species closer look at some of the species um we've already seen um close views of some of the species in the wet heaths and of course they're in the bogs as well, across the teeth, the deer grass and so on. Fundamental things, really important things to bear in mind in these habitats to know to know about. But there are a few other things that we can um, look at some photos of here. Um, some little herbs, heath spotted orchid, we had a distant view of it earlier on, here it is closer up. Uh, nice little orchid with flowers varying from almost white to sort of pale to mid pink. Um, shorter, more flattened, um, flat, flat topped flower spikes than is the case with the common spotted orchid. And um, of course you can tell the species, those two species apart by the middle lobe of the um, petals as well, which is relatively smaller and shorter in the case of the heath spotted orchid. Um, very common in lots of our wet heaths, this heath spotted orchid. Um, you can get it here and there in bogs as well and in some of the dry heaths. Um, Tormentil, it's not surprising to find this species um, illustrated here because it's in so many um, acid habitats, grasslands, heaths, dry heaths, you know, woodlands, all kinds of places, especially in the upland parts of Britain. Little um, yellow flowers with four petals and leaves with three leaflets, um, 
so the trefoil leaves and at the base of the leaf there are two leaflet like stipules easy species to tell very very common in so many heathy places and it can get into bogs a little bit as well it's not not as common in bogs on the whole as the as it is in wet heaths and dry heaths um, lousewort is um, an easy thing to tell relatively large pink flowers pale pink flowers in a low kind of spike it's very short and it branches down from ground level branches into just a few little spreading branches um, bearing these leaves that are cut up into such fine little segments they're quite untidy looking there's a related species marsh lousewort which differs in that it's got a more upright um, main stem and then little branches that come off that stem at different levels above the ground in the same way that uh, um, you get branches off a conifer tree actually something like that but much um, obviously smaller but louse were the ordinary common louse were branches from um, ground <coughs> ground level that's very common in a lot of our wet heaths not so much in bogs you get it in dry heaths but it's commoner in um, in the wet heaths next page has got some sedges um, I thought we should have a picture of the carnation sedge that I'd mentioned um, as occurring quite commonly in flushed forms of wet heath. The carnation sedge is one of those sedges whose leaves are a, a bluey green sort of tinge. Um, they're kind of glaucous um, green as opposed to just an ordinary mid green. Um, and you can see that pale, glaucous, bluey grey kind of form of green, that colour in them in that photograph there, even though it's a bit out of focus, the actual tuft in the distance. The, um, that colour is very characteristic and it is shared with some other sedges. Um, the common, particularly the common sedge, which is there to the right, which is dis differing from it in that the leaves of the common sedge are narrower, they're not quite so pale, and they they are all more upright. Um, whereas in the carnation sedge, the lower leaves spread outwards very distinctly. Um, another species with roughly similar sort of leaves is the glaucus sedge, Carex flacca. I haven't put it in here. You can get it in some of our flushed wet heaths, um, but not really so commonly as the carnation sedge. Um, the glaucus sedge, Carex flacca, has leaves that are a little bit darker on their upper surface and much paler on their underside, whereas in the carnation sedge, they're pale on both upper and lower sides, kind of uniformly um about the same same color above and below um the common sedge you can think of common sedge as being more everything's more upright the leaves stick up more and you know they don't spread so much and the female flower spikes are held upright close to the stem um, and they're hardly stalked at all and that helps them to, to be pointing up like that whereas in the carnation sedge the female spikes, you can see there's a short stalk on it there at its, at its base. Um, and some of them can have a longer stalk than that. And so they tend to stick out a little bit more. And even if they don't, you can pull them out because um, you, 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 can, you can see that they are actually stalked. There. So they're not um, forced to be so closely oppressed to the main stem. Um, and the Carnation sedge, you get fewer and bigger fruits to it. So it looks a bit untidy, that little female spike. Um, bottle sedge, unmistakable when it's got those catkin-like uh, female spikes. They're big and they're pale, lots of bottle-shaped um, little uh, fruits in them. And it's a taller plant than carnation and a common sedge. Um, and the funny thing about bottle sedge is that the leaves are actually more of they've got the pale grayish green color on their upper side whereas they're slightly darker and more of an ordinary and slightly shiny green on their lower side um, that's the opposite way around to how we see in so many plants there, there are lots of plants where the leaves are kind of a darker and shinier green on their upper side and they're paler and a matte glaucous green on their underside carnation um, but the bottle sedge sort of bucks that trend it's got the other way around <coughs> 
and it grows in very wet places scattered about in some of our wetter kinds of wet heath and in some of the bogs as well. The bog sedge um, uh, is not so common at all but it's very distinct with those little uh, female spikes held on a long and sticking out and slightly dangling down um, stalk and it's short, short plants, doesn't get very big and it's found in very wet places mainly around bog pools um, so it's always a good good thing to find. Um, star sedge is very common in all kinds of wet acid places and has leaves that are fairly fairly sort of nondescript, they're mid-green, a few uh, up to a couple of millimeters wide or so. Um, the leaves alone are not very, not that distinct, but the flower heads are and they're generally present and they can persist quite well in the late in, later into the year when they've flowered. Um, and they've got that little cluster of very starry um, little fruits. It's pretty unmistakable. And it's very common in such a wide range of acid habitats and it's not surprising we can find it, find quite a lot of it in some of our wet heaths and some of our bogs as well. Um, and these species are all, by the way, listed as NPMS positive indicators in, um, in bogs and wet heaths. So it's another reason for putting them on this page. Uh, okay, the next page is um, illustrating what the species are listed as negative indicators in bog and in wet heath as well. Uh, quite a mixed bag of things here. The birch is, um, is down there because I think the reason for it is that uh, it can be an indication of uh, sort of drying up of the habitat, especially in bogs and um, in raised bogs, especially where this tree is starting to grow in the middle in the dry of it. Uh, in many places there is um, action taken to remove them to try and keep the habitat wetter as a, as a, as a bog habitat. Um, can be a bit of a dilemma really because uh, it's natural processes of um, gradually <coughs> gradual drying out of the the most high up raised bit in, in a raised bog that's kind of a natural thing it's not surprising if some trees get in there um, but then uh, in order to maintain the distinctive bog habitats it's quite common is you know for people to understandably remove some of those trees and block drains and so on uh, but in other places people want to have more trees there um, so yeah it can be um, not always a negative thing put it that way uh, conifers likewise if it's native in the native pine zone and you've got young um, pines and juniper growing in there that can be quite a good thing uh, in in wet heaths um, and in, in bogs, not for not very common to find juniper in bogs. Although actually, I was at a place the other day, and there was a load of juniper in some in some very quite quite wet bog. Um, but yeah, there you know, in some places, even in bogs where you get pine and, and a bit of juniper growing, um, one might not necessarily want to just get in there and um, and rip them out or to class the habitat as being degraded in some kind of way because it can be just sort of natural natural processes um, so those two speak those two ones the birch and the conifers um, it's you know it's, it's not it's not a clear picture of definite uh, definitely being negative there in this habitat um, and um, the other ones the middle the ones and other ones to the right creeping thistle and stinking nettle very differently here. It's um, creeping thistle is so common, commonly associated with some combination of eutrophication or trampling, some kind of ground disturbance. If you find a lot of it um, in a wet heath or a bog, then something's been going on. You know, it's uh, quite right for that to be put down as um, something that's potentially negative. Uh, stinking nettle likewise, especially um, given that the eutrophication is um, going to be behind the abundance of that species. Uh, not very common thing to find a great amount of creeping thistle and stinking nettle in a bog. If we did, then yeah, 
it would be a sure sign that something perhaps needed attention. Um, in wet heath here and there, we can find bits maybe where there's been some localized um, concentration of sheep or cattle, that kind of disturbance and eutrophication. Um, so yeah, understandable for those species to be there. And they're easy to identify, of course. Creeping thistle, if you're wondering about the identification of it, it's that is the kind of thistle that's, that doesn't have prickles on the stems. The whole thing looks so prickly, but actually by the time you get to the stems themselves, they're actually quite smooth. Um, <clears throat> and the tall tufted rushes, they're also on the negative um, list. Uh, that's um, well, of, of, those, of those tall tufted rushes, it's really only Juncus effusus um, that is really something that could potentially be seen realistically, I think, as an indication of something um, not being, not going um, a good way in the bog and wet heath habitat. Um, the reason being that Juncus effusus, the soft brush, does take off quite well where there's been some kind of ground disturbance. It may be trampling, maybe eutrophication might encourage us as well. And also the kind of disturbance that you get where a vehicle has gone, where they had sort of um, machinery going in there. You get a lot of Juncus effusus growing on the edges of tracks that have been built across wet heaths or wet heaths and bogs even. So understandable to find um, that uh, on the negative list. Although, as I said in the notes there, it, it does occur more naturally in some kind of, some kind of um, local environments within bog and wet heath mosaics, like where it's a bit more flushed along the edge of the stream, that kind of uh, um, situation. But that's quite distinct from just having a lot of scattered junk diffusers over um, air, big areas of bog and, and wet heath, which is something we don't really tend to see unless there's been some kind of disturbance. Um, okay, we're almost at the end here and we've got on the next page, some questions are saying, Asking, yeah, what are the two most abundant and prominent, prominent graminoids? That's graminoids, by the way, grasses, sedges, rushes, and wood rushes um, in wet heaths. And um, the leaves of the carnation sedge and the common sedge, what's the difference? I'll give you a minute or so to um, put some things there. At this point, it's to see whether everyone's been paying attention towards the end, I guess. <laughs> Brill, okay. I'll, um, I was just giving a few minutes there for some people to vote. Um, people still voting. Okay, I'll end it there. So I'll share results and I'll go to your answers page. Yeah, it's the. Um... Purple moor grass and deer grass are the two most um, abundant and prominent, prominent graminoids in wet heaths. Um, and they, they give the wet heath in so many places that kind of what you could call a salt and pepper effect, light and dark. Um, the light being the graminoids, the dark being the um, ericoid dwarf shrubs, the heather and the cross-leaf heath. Um, and Carnation sedge leaves wider, paler, more widely spreading than those of the common sedge. Common sedge, you can think upright, is a general word that applies to leaves and the, um, the female spikelets. Uh, next page has uh, yeah, another question there. So, would you expect a wet heath that's lost its dwarf shrubs because of heavy grazing to go more grassy or more sedgy? or either stroke both. Definite split down the middle of this one. <laughs> <laughs> And it's either or both because it can be going towards millennia dominance or towards deer grass dominance. So um, it can be either or both. <laughs> 
and um, and that's that's mentioned on that page. And then the next page again, um, another another question, a rather different question. Do you think this kind of um, wet heath, purple moor grass, heather, and bog myrtle, with a bit of young downy birch and willow, has done it as in this drawing that I've done? Do you think that should be looked upon positively or negatively in in kind of conservation terms? That's a, this is a different kind of question, really. It's not a sort of factual yes or no. Um, Very sub subjective, these sorts of questions, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. And we've got a mix of answers. And um, I've... Uh, ventured to say that your answer is going to be right, whatever it is. The reason being that both views, both, both viewpoints could be seen as being valid. Uh, there's not any kind of um, uniform agreement either way. So um, some people might say they'd look upon it favorably uh, because you've got that young tree and shrub regeneration. Um, so in, in a place where it's very likely that there would have been more kind of woodland, more tree growth there before. And so if it was seeming to, um, especially if you've got an old dead tree, um, so it would be seeming to be getting back towards something or more of a woodland kind of environment. Um, but then other, in another way, it might be seen negatively because it's changing the wet heath environment, which can be, then the wet heath environment itself can be recognized as being of some interest. For its, for its specifically for its heath and characteristics, um, and that they might potentially be um, be lost if it becomes more wooded. And actually, that could happen particularly if the place has been, say, if it's been deer fenced, and so there's no grazing and everything's growing very really tall and thick, and just a few species like um, it could be heather and purple moor grass to get so tall and thick tall and dense, maybe unnaturally tall and dense and dominant, is to um, exclude other, other plants and leading to something that's more species poor, um, albeit with young trees growing. So um, the, it's an open-ended question, that one, with uh, uh, various different uh, viewpoints, <laughs> no, with, with no, no particular um, definite answer. So just that kind of thing that's um, food for thought. Okay, well, that's always at the end. So because the last page is um, a drawing with wet heath and um, boggy habitats going up in uh, from low, lower ground on Ranachmore up towards the higher ground with some bits of snow. And saying really thanks for um, the session. I hope it's been, hope it's been profitable for you to spend the last whatever, nearly couple of hours here and if you've got any questions fire them away um, yeah, thank you ben it's been an excellent series apologies for the slight noise of my printer that's decided to work now even though i was print, trying to print something this morning it's only printing two sheets so it should be done in a minute um we did get an interesting one come in um sort of earlier on i thought almost is more like a discussion topic rather than necessarily a question uh, which is sort of saying, what are the environmental benefits of having lots of heath, apart from preventing methane loss from peat? There seems to be a relatively small number of fairly common species, and I could understand somebody asking, why do we need to preserve them? And this person thinks, well, how could I explain their value to somebody else? Um, somebody sort of has um, also sort of uh, put their thoughts across regarding this and have said that there's huge potential for carbon sequestration and water storage from peatland restoration. Peatland habitats are of high distinctiveness in supporting species and species assemblages not found elsewhere and I believe the UK supports a disproportionate quantity of remaining peatland habitat in Europe. Heathland is often closely linked to cultural heritage of local areas through common grazing and turbary rights and in the production of high quality geographically distinct products such as Scotch whiskey. So um, some answers there. So uh, Ben, what are your thoughts about if somebody was to say, well, what's the point, you know, that these barren landscapes, why are we preserving them, etc.? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, 
wet heat well bogs for bogs and wet heat i suppose the argument is slightly different bogs has got have got uh, particularly um obvious uh, value for carbon storage in, in the deep peak and um uh, and also for storing um water and then releasing it more slowly and, and with regard to flooding downstream and everything there they're a sort of um, useful thing in the landscape from that point of view as well and their habitat for all kinds of um, interesting plant species and breeding habitat for birds and so on. Uh, this sphagnum component, for example, of, of bogs can include some pretty rare ones and there are other kinds of mosses and liverworts that you can get in bogs. There are all sorts of um, kind of parallel reasons that are like parallel with what you would say about things like species rich grasslands, you know, all kinds of um, floristic varieties. Um, and yeah, function in the landscape from the point of view of hydrology and carbon storage. Wet heaths, um, well, the same can apply in, in many respects. Obviously there's not so much peat, but it's still there. They're still holding that peat there and carbon storage. Um, so they are of value in that way. Um, it's a, a lot of wet heaths, as is the case with dry heaths, are relatively species poor floristically, but um, I don't think that should be seen as a problem. I think it's quite natural for some kinds of vegetation to be species poor. And we don't, um, well, we, we, we have great extents of wet heath in Britain and Ireland on an international level, actually. So, um, yeah, globally speaking, it's an important part of the world for this habitat. What is not um, wholly, not, not sort of 100% clear is exactly how much of that wet heath would once have been wooded. And I think, yeah, people's opinions vary on this point. Um, and when it comes to the matter of um, trying to get new woodland to um, to grow, whether it be through planting or natural regeneration, there's a lot of um, a lot of work done in this direction now, with things like deer fencing to try and get natural regeneration occurring of, of birch and so on. Um, that can be on the assumption that the, a lot of wet heath at lower altitudes certainly would once have been wooded. Um, but how, uh, and I think it probably was, I think the lower altitude wet heaths would have been. But how far up the hills you have to go before it would, would be more naturally wet heath, you don't really know. And I think it would be a shame to lose huge areas of wet heath, having forced some kind of planting in, in there, only to find later on that maybe actually there would have been naturally quite a bit of openness to sort of some of that ground, even some of the lower altitude wet heaths. So um, it's, not, it's not hugely clear, clear cut. Maybe also, I think if you, you only have to walk in and have a look close in the wet heath vegetation and find how amazingly varied it is on a small scale, some more flushed, some not so, and so on, to, to start to appreciate it more. Um, people, people often describe some of these landscapes with a lot of wet heath as being kind of degraded landscapes, mainly in terms of their uh, lack of trees. But another thing that comes to my mind then is that if they were to go to some, if this is in Scotland, where this is most commonly said, if they were to go to parts of, say, um, parts of Wales, where there is seriously heavily grazed ground, so much so that it's mostly acid grassland and even wet heath of any kind is hard to come by, then people might appreciate it more because <laughs> uh, it's a it is a, it is a, a habitat with um, surprising amount of variation. Even though it's on the whole rather species poor, it's still um, a valid habitat, and Britain and Ireland are the best parts of the world for it. And although you might say species poor, some of these species you wouldn't get in any other habitat. So you know they're quite sort of specific, and and that goes um, obviously with the plants, but also in other taxa so you can get some pretty rare you know invertebrates and things that will only live in these type of habitats and and they've kind of evolved with it so 
that you know they are special places I know that I enjoy a bog <laughs> quite quite a lot um just to wrap up here also um just to say this will be um on our YouTube channel hopefully over the weekend uh, for anyone that needs to catch up and uh, somebody's had a good idea for maybe a webinar or a YouTube thing on flushes in particular. So yes, I think I will add that to my list of potentials for next year. Um, other things that we were thinking of is maybe focusing a little bit, Ben, on some of the mosses that you've sort of covered in some of your other webinars, even though MPMS doesn't cover mosses yet. Um, I feel like they are so intrinsic to habitat sort of classification that actually spending a little bit more time on them could be really useful. Um, so that's one of the things that we might do next year as well, um, because all of these ones will still be available. So we'll just be building, building upon what we've already done. So great talk again, Ben. Thank you. And we love your poem. Um, and uh, yeah, they all, you should bring out a book of NPMS inspired poems, maybe. Uh, yeah, somebody saying about that. That's that's really good. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, and yeah, we'll hopefully see some of you soon. Do get in contact with me if you've got any questions, um, anything about maybe your plot and what habitat it is. You know, if you send pictures and some descriptions, we can always try and work out what you've got on your hands. So great to see you all and have a great weekend. And thank you, Ben. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.